All right, today we're going to talk about uh, Lesson 2-2, Basic Differentiation Rules and Rates of Change. So now that you've been introduced to the derivative, which remember our interpretation so far is the slope of the tangent line, and you've seen that it's uh, the limit of the difference quotient as h approaches 0. Now it's, as you probably noticed, it's kind of a long, tedious process. but because of various rules, there are many shortcuts or pr uh, procedures that we can use that makes the process actually a lot faster where we're not actually using limits anymore. So what you'll notice for the rest of this unit is that we're going to start looking at different rules, different shortcuts that we can use to find the derivative of a function. Today we're also, in addition to that, we're also going to look at one other interpretation of what the derivative can mean for us. But we're going to start by looking at these basic differentiation rules and then looking at some examples where we apply those rules. All right, so the first basic derivative that we're going to look at says if c is any real number, so it's a constant, then the derivative of c, remember this d dx, that's one of the notations that you learned the last time, then the derivative of that constant is 0. So this is telling you that the derivative of any constant function is 0. And let's just go ahead and take a look at why that is. Now, the work I'm about to show you, I do not want you to write down. I don't need you to even memorize it or anything. You're never going to have to show this again. But I want you to understand that these basic derivatives are still based on the limit definition that you just learned. OK, so let's assume that f of x is some constant function f of x equals c. Well, then that means that the derivative remember is the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. But now remember if f of x is a constant then there is nowhere to input the x plus h. There's nothing to replace it. So we now have the limit as h approaches 0 of the constant because no matter what the input is the output is still that constant minus f of x, which is also that constant, all divided by h. But c minus c is 0. And then remember, since h is approaching 0, then that means h isn't actually 0. But the numerator really is 0, because it was the constant minus the constant. So this now becomes the limit as h approaches 0 of the constant 0. And as you saw in the last, the last lesson, or I'm sorry, the last unit, the limit of a constant is just that constant. So that's why the derivative of a constant function is 0. Again, you don't have to know this. You don't have to remember this. But I do want you to understand that all of these basic derivative rules could be derived using this approach, using these limit definitions. The second basic derivative rule, if c is a real number, so again, if c is any constant, then the derivative of the constant times a function is just the constant times the derivative of that function. Now think about this. Remember, since derivatives are limits, you've seen this with limits before. Remember that if you have the limit as x approaches some number, I'll say a, if you have the limit of a constant times a function, Remember that we've been able to move that constant out in front and then just take the limit of that function. So that's basically what's happening here. We have the derivative of a constant times a function, and that allows us to move the constant out in front. All right, the third basic derivative. This one shouldn't come as a surprise, and again, this should look pretty familiar to you based on our limit properties that we've already learned. If I have the derivative of the sum or difference of two functions, then that's going to equal the sum or the difference of the derivative of each separate function. And again, because de uh, derivatives are limits, this shouldn't surprise us that it's behaving the same way that our limit properties allowed us to do. All right, this fourth basic derivative is going to be one of the most powerful shortcuts for us so far. If n is any rational number, now remember a rational number could be positive, it could be negative, it could be zero, but a rational number can be written as a fraction of two integers. So 3 fourths is a rational number, 
um, but square root of 2 is not. So uh, if n is any rational number, then the derivative of x to the n power is n times x to the n minus 1. So what I want you to notice is the power of the function that you are finding the derivative of multiplies out in front, and then it decreases by 1. This is referred to as the power rule. And you're going to see us use this a lot. So the power rule is going to be one of the most powerful tools or shortcuts that we're going to have at our disposal for derivatives. And the last two basic derivatives that we're going to look at for today are the derivative of the sine of x function and the derivative of the cosine of x function. Now before I reveal what these are, I actually want to show you where it comes from, at least for one of them. So we're going to actually come up with the derivative of the sine of x function using the limit definition. And again, that's what justifies this shortcut. But what's happening is we get to use the shortcut because it's the same process otherwise every single time. Okay, so how do we get the derivative of sine of x? So that means if we're going to let f of x, oh, and once again, do not worry about copying this down. You're never going to have to recreate this. You don't have to memorize this. I just want you to be able to see where this comes from so that you understand that this is still all rooted in the limit definition that you just learned. So f of x is going to be sine of x. So if I'm trying to find the derivative, then that means I've got the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. But remember, we're going to now replace, oops, not x. We're now going to replace the x in sine of x with x plus h in this first expression. So I have the sine of x plus h minus f of x, which is sine of x all over h. Now, you might recall this, you might not, but in pre-calculus, when you were learning a bunch of different trig identities, you did have a trig identity that dealt with the sum of two angles. So we're going to use that identity now. And this is probably one that you haven't memorized, and that's okay. You don't have to have memorized this particular trig identity for this course. But you should know that it exists. So sine of x plus h, that does become the sine of x times the cosine of h plus the cosine of x times the sine of h. And then remember, this is still minus sine of x all over h. OK, so the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rearrange the terms and regroup them a little bit. So in the numerator, I'm going to go ahead and put the sine of x cosine of h, that's there. And I'm going to move this minus sine of x up toward the front. And then I'm going to leave that plus cosine of x sine of h. And again, this is all divided by h. And then now, I'm going to group those together. So the first two terms of the numerator divided by h along with the last term divided by the h. And I'm going to separate that into two separate limits. So I have the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x times cosine of h minus the sine of x all over h, and then plus the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine of x sine of h over h. OK, so now why would I have done that? Let me move this down a little bit. So why would I do that? So now, if you look in the first limit that I have here, in the numerator, notice that both terms have a sine of x. Let's go ahead and factor out that sine of x. So now I've got the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of x times cosine of h minus 1 all over h plus and over here I'm gonna go ahead and make this cosine of x times sine of h over h 
and some of you might see where I'm going with this now. Now remember, we're dealing with the limit as h approaches 0. And if we're talking about a limit as h approaches a number, then any other variable is treated like a constant. So that means for this first limit, the sine of x is essentially treated as a constant. So really, this is going to become the sine of x times the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine of h minus 1 over h. Plus, same story here with the second limit. Cosine of x, because it's in terms of x, is treated like a constant. So I'm going to move that out in front times the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of h over h. And now I'm hoping that some of you spot something familiar here. So this first limit is almost exactly the special trig limit, one of the special trig limits you learned in the last unit. Now in the last unit, you saw the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x. So in other words, the subtraction in the numerator was flipped. But I could just factor out a negative, and that would be the same thing then. So this limit right here does become 0. So now I have the sine of x times 0 plus. Now over here, hopefully you definitely rec uh, re recognize this limit. We have the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of h over h. That is 1. So the sine of x times 0, that's just going to go away. Cosine of x times 1 gives us the cosine of x. So what that means then is that the derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. Okay, so coming back up here to our list. So that means for number 5, the derivative of sine of x is the cosine of x. Now, I'm not going to take the time to do it, but to find the derivative of cosine of x, we could do a very similar process using the sum of angles formula for cosine. As it turns out, the derivative of cosine of x is negative sine of x. All right, so these six basic derivatives are what we're going to be working with today. So now let's go ahead and take a look at several examples that utilize these. All right, here's our first example. So we're going to differentiate each function using basic derivatives. Now notice it does not say using the limit definition, so we should not be using limits here. That's going to take us far too long for a problem like this. We are specifically being asked to use basic derivatives, meaning we are going to use whatever tools, whatever shortcuts are available to us at this point. All right, so we do have a function. Now notice this function is the sum or difference of several individual terms. And we do know that we have a property that allows us to find the derivative then of each term separately and add or subtract those results. We also have a constant times a function, which means that derivative will be the constant times the derivative of x to the power. And then we have the power rule. So by using all of those basic derivatives in combination with each other, to find the derivative of this function is going to actually be very fast. So this is going to be, and I'm going to show a little bit more work than I would normally ask just for this example, and then I'm going to show you how quickly I would expect you to just start to do this. So this is going to be the constant times the derivative of x to the third. Remember, another way we can show the derivative is by putting the expression in brackets and then a prime outside. Minus 7 times the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of x minus the derivative of 12. Again, this is way more work than I would ever want you to show, but I want you to understand where this is coming from. I also want to point out that notice, because I'm now finding the derivative, this now says f prime equals, f prime of x equals. Okay, so this is now going to be 8 times. Now the derivative of x to the third, we can use the power rule that we just saw earlier. And remember the way that the power rule works, we take the current exponent, we multiply that in front, and then we drop the exponent down by 1. So that 3 becomes a 2. 
minus, now I've got seven times, same thing here, x squared, the derivative of x squared using the power rule, becomes two times x to the first. Plus, now an x by itself, remember this is technically, this is technically an x to the first power. So that means the derivative of that would be one times x to the zero. And then finally, we have minus, we have the derivative of a constant. And remember, that was the very first basic derivative that I showed. The derivative of a constant is just zero. Now, I do wanna just point out here, remember x to the zero power, anything to the zero power is zero. Sorry, is one. Can't believe I just recorded that. Sorry about that. All right, so that means we now have 24x to the second minus 14x plus, now again, this is a one times a one, which is one. And then minus zero, which we don't have to add. So f prime of x turns out to be 24x squared minus 14x plus one. This is the result that you would get if you were to use the full limit definition on that original function. But remember, if you were using the full limit definition, you would have had to have cubed x plus h, and then squared x plus h, and then multiplied, combined like terms, figured out all the different factors. It would have been not impossible, but definitely a mess, as opposed to this shortcut. Now, I did say that this is more work than I would normally ask you to show. What would I normally want you to do? Normally, I would actually encourage you just to go from the original problem straight to this answer here because there was nothing particularly tricky about the original function. So if I were gonna use the power rule on the original function, I would hope or expect eventually that you would notice that to use the power rule, this three is gonna multiply in front, but because there's already an eight there, we're just gonna multiply the three with the eight to get 24 and then the three drops down to a two power. Same thing with the minus seven x squared, taking the derivative there, the two multiplies with the seven and we get a 14, and then the two drops down to a one. The derivative of x, as you're gonna see multiple times, that's just one, and then the derivative of a constant is zero, so it completely goes away. So that's what I would expect to see in terms of work. Okay, so what about a problem like this. So we have y equals the fifth root of x squared plus one over x to the third minus five cosine of x. So this function is just trying to throw quite a bit at you. Now for this particular function, again, we can do this term by term, but you'll notice none of the basic derivatives above specifically talked about radicals. However, the power rule does talk about rational powers. And remember that a radical really is just a fraction exponent. So before I'm finding the derivative, before I find the derivative, I'm just gonna rewrite this function so that all of my terms match the form of the rules that we were given. So the fifth root of x squared, I'm going to rewrite that as x to the two-fifths power. Plus, now again, none of the basic derivatives that we've learned so far talked about having a fraction where your power of x is in the denominator. So we can't deal with that in its current form. We can't find the derivative of one over x to the third at this point. We can, however, rewrite this. Remember that if you have a power of x in the denominator, you can move this up to the numerator by taking the opposite power. So one over x to the third, remember, is the same as x to the negative third. And then finally, we have that minus five cosine of x, and that's actually okay in its current form. So this is actually the function that we're gonna differentiate. Now notice this still says y equals because I haven't actually found the derivative yet. I was only rewriting y. So this is still y. It's just in a slightly different form, but it's in a form that's gonna make it easier for us to find the derivative using our rules. So now to find the derivative, 
we're going to use our rules. So y prime, remember that's another notation we just learned. So y prime is going to be, all right, so the derivative of x to the 2 fifths using the power rule becomes 2 fifths x to the, now 2 fifths minus 1 gives me negative 3 fifths. All right, plus. Now power rule on x to the negative third. So remember the negative three comes out in front. And then we have x to the, and then negative three minus one gives me a negative four. And then minus five times, now the derivative of cosine, remember, is negative sine of x. So finally, Finally, when I clean this up a little bit, I'm going to have y prime equals 2 fifths x to the negative 3 fifths. I'm just going to write this here as minus 3x to the negative fourth. And then I have a negative times a negative, so that does become plus 5 sine of x. Those negative exponents, I do not need you to rewrite them in the denominator as positive. You can, you are welcome to, but it's not required. If you choose to do that, then this would become 2 over 5x to the 3 fifths minus 3 over x to the fourth plus 5 times the sine of x. Again, you are welcome to do that, but there's no need for us to do that because right now we're not trying to do anything else with that function. We're just trying to find the derivative, okay? All right, example C. We have y equals x cubed times x plus 4 quantity squared. Now, you might be tempted to think that this is going to just be the derivative of x to the third times the derivative of x plus 4 squared. But with derivatives, it doesn't work out that way. So that's not how you find the derivative of a product. There's actually a different rule that we will eventually study to do this. So we still need to try to make this just match an expanded polynomial form, much like example A. So what we're going to have to do first before I find the derivative is I'm just going to rewrite this by expanding the squared binomial. So this is going to be x squared plus 8x plus 16. And then now I can distribute that x to the third, and I get y equals x to the fifth, remember you're adding the powers here, plus 8x to the fourth, plus 16x to the third. So that's the function whose derivative we're going to try to find now. So now to find y prime, we're just once again going to use our power rule term by term. So the derivative of x to the fifth, remember that's going to be 5x to the fourth plus the derivative of 8x to the fourth. Remember, we're going to multiply the 4 in front with the 8. That's going to give us a 32x to the, and then the 4 drops down by 1, becomes a 3. And then finally, plus 3 times 16, that gives us a 48x to the second. All right, what about this example here? So you just saw that the derivative of a function that's a product is not just going to be the product of the derivatives. We had to do something a little bit different. We had to rewrite it, expand it. Same story here. The derivative of a quotient is not just the derivative of the top divided by the derivative of the bottom. It's actually much more complicated than that. So again, we're going to have to rewrite this function first. So there are a couple different ways we can do that. Here's the way I'm going to choose to do it. So remember that square root of x is really x to the 1 half. But because it's in the denominator, I can move that up to the numerator as an x to the negative 1 half. And now it's multiplying with our numerator. And then now, finally, I can distribute the x to the negative 1 half, which remember, because I'm adding the powers, but one of them is negative, we're technically going to be subtracting a 1 half. So this now becomes 4x to the, now 3 minus a half is 2 and a half. 
But remember, we need to write this as a rational number, so that's going to be 5 halves. Because remember, 3 is 6 halves, so 6 halves minus 1 half gives us 5 halves. Plus 2x times x to the negative 1 half, so that's going to be 2x to the positive 1 half, because it's a 1 minus a 1 half. And then finally, plus 5x to the negative 1 half. So this is our g of x that we're going to find the derivative of now. So g prime of x equals, all right, so using the power rule, 4 times 5 halves, that's going to be 10, x to the 3 halves when I drop it by 1, okay, plus 1 half times 2 is just a 1, and then 1 half minus 1 is negative a half. And then now I have negative 1 half times 5, which is going to be negative 5 halves. x to the, now negative 1 half minus another 1, gives me negative 3 halves. And this is our derivative. Okay, so let's revisit the question then that you just did on yesterday's lesson. We're going to write the equation of the tangent line to the function f of x equals x cubed plus 2x minus 1 at x equals 2. Now again, you just did this, and remember, if you are trying to write the equation of the tangent line, then there are two things you need to know. First, you need to know the slope, which remember is the derivative. The slope of the tangent line is the derivative at that value, which in this case is 2. So we need to know what is f prime of 2. We also need to know the ordered pair. So we also need to know 2 comma f of 2. So those are the two things that we need to find. So first, let's find the slope. So if this is our f of x, so if our f of x is x cubed plus 2x minus 1, then that means f prime of x will be 3x squared plus 2. And then now we can find f prime of 2 by replacing our x with a 2. So this is going to be a 2 squared, which is a 4. 3 times 4 gives me a 12. 12 plus 2 gives me 14. So this is our slope. And then remember, we're also supposed to find f of 2. Now f of 2. That means I want 2 cubed plus 2 times 2 minus 1. Now 2 cubed is 8 plus 2 times 2, which is 4. So 8 plus 4 is going to be 12. Minus 1 gives me 11. So that means our point is actually going to be at 2 comma 11. So finally, to write that equation of the tangent line, remember we're using point slope formula. So now I can just substitute the values that we got. Remember, the slope was 14. Sorry, I shouldn't box that. That makes it look like the answer. So the slope was 14. The ordered pair is 2 comma 11. So now we can write this as y minus 11 equals 14 times x minus 2. Now, on the AP exam, normally this would be acceptable if all they were asking for is the equation of the tangent line. But on WebAssign, they are often asking you to set this as a y equals. So at the very least, you would need to add this 11 to the other side. So we could write this as y equals 11 plus 14 times x minus 2. That's one of various ways that you could write the final answer. You could even go further if you wanted to. You can do 11 plus, distribute the 14. You would have a 14x minus 28. And then 11 minus 28 is going to give you a negative 17. So you actually would get y equals 14x minus 17. All right, so now here's another kind of a question that we can ask related to derivatives. So the question says, at what point or points, x comma y, if any, does g of x equals x cubed minus 12x have a horizontal tangent line? A horizontal tangent line. Now let's think about what that means to us. So we've already talked about the tangent line 
And so the tangent line has to do with the derivative, and the derivative is the slope of the tangent line. And if we're talking about a tangent line that's horizontal, remember from Math 1 that if you have a horizontal line, then its slope is 0. So a question asking us where a function has a horizontal tangent line, the question is really asking where does the derivative, which in this case becomes g prime, where does g prime of x equal 0? That's what this question is actually asking. So when you are trying to figure out where a function has a horizontal tangent line, we're really trying to figure out where does the derivative equal 0? Because that would then mean that the tangent line has a slope of 0. So to do this, first let's find g prime of x. Well, remember if g of x was x cubed minus 12x, then g prime of x must be 3x squared minus 12. And if I'm trying to now set g prime of x equal to 0, but remember that g prime of x is 3x squared minus 12. Well, I can now factor this. This is 3 times x squared minus 4, which becomes 3 times x plus 2 times x minus 2. And that means x equals negative 2, or x equals positive 2. So those are the values of x where the original function g would have horizontal tangent lines. But remember, they are asking for the ordered pairs x comma y, so we do need to actually substitute these back into g. So g of negative 2 is going to be negative 2 cubed minus 12 times negative 2. Now that's going to be a negative 8 plus 24, which gives us 16. So that's going to occur at negative 2 comma 16. That's one of the points where we've got a horizontal tangent line. And we're also going to do the same thing for g of positive 2. So again, that's going to be a 2 cubed minus 12 times 2. That's going to become 8 minus 24, which is negative 16. So we also have a horizontal tangent line at the point 2 comma negative 16. Okay, and we're going to wrap up this lesson by talking about another interpretation of the derivative. Again, you've heard me talk many times so far about the derivative representing the slope of the tangent line. But here's another thing we can consider. So let's think about this function here, d of t, where t is measured in hours and d is measured in miles. So if I were to take a secant line, Remember from the last lesson, a secant line goes through two points. So if I were to take that secant line, let's say that that's at A, and that second point is at B, and then I were to find the slope of that. Well, that's going to be D of B minus D of A over B minus A. That's the slope of the secant line. Now remember, though, D is measured in miles. And then t was measured in hours. So really, what this is doing is this is actually finding the rate of change. This is miles per hour. But it's over this interval from a to b. So what this is actually representing is the average rate of change on that interval. So what we want to know is that the average rate of change so the average rate of change of some function f on the interval from a to b is just the slope. It's f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, so the slope of the secant line is really giving us the average rate of change over some particular interval. But now remember, the derivative was the slope of the tangent line. So the tangent line
that still gives us a rate of change, but because it's at a single moment, that's interpreted as the instantaneous rate of change. So in addition to thinking about the derivative as the slope of the tangent line, we can also understand that the derivative represents the instantaneous rate of change at x equals a. So as opposed to an average rate of change which occurs over a time interval, the instantaneous rate of change happens at a specific point, at a specific moment. And so that is really just f prime of a. And you're going to see us use this as we start to investigate applications of the derivative in the following units. Okay, not in this unit, in the following units. But for now I am introducing to you this idea that it does represent the instantaneous rate of change. So let's wrap up with this last example. So we're going to find the average rate of change of f of x equals 3 sine of x on the closed interval from 0 to pi halves. And then we're going to compare that average rate of change with the instantaneous rate of change at each endpoint of the interval. Okay, so they're actually asking us to find three things. So let's start by finding the average rate of change. So again, the average rate of change. Remember that that's just the slope over that interval. So that means the average rate of change is going to be 3 times the sine of pi halves, which is our b, minus 3 times the sine of 0, which is our a, all over pi halves minus 0. Okay, now you may recall that the sine of pi halves is 1, so I've got 3 times 1 minus 3 times the sine of 0, which is 0, all over pi halves minus 0, which is still pi halves. So this is now going to be 3, yeah, let's work over here, so this is now going to be 3 divided by pi halves. Now remember, if I'm dividing by a fraction, that's really 3 times 2 over pi, so you're multiplying by the reciprocal. And finally, that gives me 6 over pi. So the average rate of change on the interval from 0 to pi halves is 6 over pi. Now it's asking us to compare that result to the instantaneous rate of change at each endpoint. And remember, that means what we're really trying to find then. If I want the instantaneous rate of change at x equals 0, then that means they're asking us to find f prime of 0. And if I'm trying to find the instantaneous rate of change at x equals pi halves, then that means I want f prime of pi halves. But to find either of those, first I need to know what is f prime of x. So let's find that. Well, remember if f of x, eh, let's work it over here. So if f of x is 3 times the sine of x, then f prime of x is 3 times the derivative of sine of x, which you might recall is just cosine of x. So f prime of 0 is asking then for 3 times the cosine of 0. Remember, cosine of 0 is 1, so this just gives me 3. And then finally, we have 3 times the cosine of pi halves when I substitute pi halves into f prime. Now cosine of pi halves, that is 0. So I have 3 times 0, which gives me 0. OK. And remember, 6 divided by pi, pi is slightly bigger than 3. So 6 divided by something slightly bigger than 3 is going to be a little bit less than 2. And remember, this is the average rate of change over this interval. So it should make sense then that we've got maybe a value higher than that, but a value lower than that. All right. So again, in addition to interpreting the derivative as the slope of the tangent, we can also consider the derivative as the instantaneous rate of change at a specific moment.